Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day three of New Voices, New Rooms, and our third author breakfast of the conference. My name is Jason Hafer. I'm one of the owners of Reeds & Company in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. We're located about 20 miles northwest of Philadelphia, and we're a relatively new store. Uh, we only opened in May of 2019, so the past three years have obviously been very smooth without any major challenges. Um, I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, today's session is Alternate Futures, Four Scenarios, and we have four great books and authors to share with you. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to say a thank you to the publisher sponsors of this panel, Tor.com Publishing, Algonquin Books, Hachette, Harper Perennial, and Tor Books. Thank you so much for your support. Um, thank you also to everyone at NABA and SIVA for putting together a great lineup of programming this week. Um, we all know the challenges of doing something like this virtually, but I think they've, they've done a really nice job for um, their members and, and us booksellers this week, so it's much appreciated. Hopefully, um, the next time we're all in this environment, it will be in person so we can be together. Um, I'd like to say um, hello to all the booksellers and bookstores that are on, on the chat today or on the webinar today. Um, feel free to use the chat to shout out your store, um, ask any questions that you'd like. Um, the, um, the authors won't respond to the questions um, during the session, but they will be shared with them later. Um, okay, back to alternate futures for scenarios. Um, I'm going to introduce each of the authors and they'll tell you a little bit about the book we are featuring during the session, then we'll move on to a more general discussion. Um, our first author is Ruthanna Emrys. She lives in a mysterious manor house on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. with her wife and their large, strange family. Her stories have appeared in a number of venues, including Strange Horizons, Analog, and Tour.com. She's the author of the Innsmouth Legacy series, which began with Winter Tide. Uh, she makes homemade vanilla, obsesses about game design, gives unsolicited advice, and occasionally attempts to save the world. Today, she will be discussing A Half-Built Garden, published by Tor.com, which came out on July 26th. Uh, welcome, Ruthanna, and can you tell us a little bit about A Half-Built Garden? Uh, sure, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. A uh, Half-Built Garden is... Uh, Novel, the first contact novel. Uh, it takes place uh, in, I would say near future, but it sounds like we're having a tighter definition of near future this morning. So uh, in the 2080s with a world that has just started to figure out how to solve climate change and is uh, now dealing with a problem that they are not so well geared to solve, which is a very helpful alien showing up and saying that they would like to rescue us from Earth, whether or not we want to be rescued. Um, it also has a really lovely cover by Mark Smith. Yeah, that is a great cover. Um, thanks, Ruthanna, and welcome. Um, next up is Silas House. Um, he's the New York Times bestselling author of seven novels. Uh, one book of creative nonfiction and three plays. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Advocate, Time, Garden and Gun, and other publications. A former commentator for NPR's All Things Considered, House is the winner of the Nautilus Award, the Storylines Prize for NAV um, New York Public Library, an E.B. White Honor, and many other awards. Today, Silas will be discussing Lark Ascending, which comes out on September 27th and will be published by Algonquin Books. Uh, good morning, Silas. And you can, can you introduce us a little bit to Lark Ascending? Good morning, thank you so much. Um, well, Lark is, it's set in the near future about 20 years from now. And the lead character is Lark. He's a young man who has lost everything, including the love of his life. And um, the novel is sort of epic in scope in that he walks from Maryland to Maine to Nova Scotia. He uh, manages to get on to an overcrowded refugee boat that takes him to Ireland. He is uh, on the run from fundamentalist forces who um, have sort of gained power via a climate catastrophe. And as a gay man, he's on the run because uh, queer relationships, well, queer existence has been outlawed and punishable by death. Um, and so once he gets to Ireland, he uh, manages to create a family for himself with a mysterious woman and an abandoned beagle um, in a time when there are only a handful of dogs left. And so they uh, walk across Ireland seeking a safe place. Um, the book is 
a lot about intense grief. It's a, for me, it grows out of personal grief, but also the global sense of grief that I think so many of us have been feeling, whether it's because of witnessing uh, the climate disaster, uh, the climate catastrophe, or uh, witnessing the demise of democracy. Um, and so I have survived that grief by uh, being with dogs and in the natural world and by walking. And so that's what I wrote about. Great, thank you, Silas. Um... Next up is uh, Lucinda, uh, novelist, poet, and memoirist. Lucinda Roy is the author of the speculative novel, The Freedom Race, and three collections of poetry, including fabric, poems. Um, her early novels are Lady Moses, a Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writers selection, um, and The Hotel Alleluia. She has uh, also authored the memoir, No Right, to Re no right to Remain Silent, What We've Learned from the Tragedy at Virginia Tech. Uh, among her awards are the Eighth Mountain Prize for Poetry and the Baxter uh, Hathaway Prize for her long slave narrative poem, Needlework, and a statewide faculty recognition award. She was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Richmond, um, an alumni distinguished professor at Virginia Tech. She teaches fiction, poetry, and creative nonfiction in the graduate and undergraduate creative writing program. Um, she has been a guest on numerous TV and radio shows, including the CBS Evening News, The Today Show, Good Morning America, CBS's Sunday Morning, Oprah, and NPR. Her work has appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education, North American Review, The New York Times, The Guardian, USA Today, American Poetry Review, and many other publications. She delivers keynotes and presentations around the country on creative writing, diversity, campus safety, and higher education. Uh, today, Lucinda will be discussing Flying the Coop, which came out on July 5th from Tour and is the sequel to The Freedom Race. Um, hi, Lucinda, and welcome to New Voices, New Rooms. Can you tell us uh, more about Flying the Coop? I can, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, it's lovely to be here with all of you. I have to say, I've just started reading Silas's uh, Southernmost because Lark Ascending wasn't out yet, and I'm finding it fascinating. And Ruth Anna, I've also just begun your novel. I'm sorry, I haven't read it yet. Uh, but that, too, seems to have some real connections to some of the things that I'm doing. You and I can't wait to get yours. I'm sorry I'm so behind with reading, but I'm trying to catch up. Um, I, I also want to say independent book, bookstores really rock. So I'm so pleased that uh, we're doing this today. It seems to me that especially now in this environment when everything is dangerous, everything is risky if you say certain things, that independent bookstores and librarians are the, are the kind of nexus of this problem in lots of ways and we ought to do whatever we can to support them. Um, I, special hello to everybody from Virginia. I see there's quite a few people who've joined from Virginia today. Um, Flying the Coop is the second novel in my trilogy, and the trilogy is called The Dreamberg Chronicles. It's set in what I would also call the near future, um, and uh, it's about what happens after a second civil war. There's been a second civil war called the sequel, and the country has divided up. It's trifurcated, and in the middle is a, a place called the Homestead Territories, which is segregated. And it was caused through secessionism and so on, which is something I think we're we're going to see very soon in, in the US. And uh, it's also built around racial conflicts. I'm biracial myself. And uh, many of the people who are imported from uh, what they call the cradle in my book, which is Africa, um, uh, were originally imported as indentured labor and then eventually became enslaved labor. Uh, but I didn't want to write about why the caged bird sings. I wanted to write about how the caged bird flies. And so what I wanted to find out was how would you survive? What would be some of the dreams and the stories and the things that would inspire you to know that you can somehow get out of this situation? And how would you deal with the politics and how would you deal with identity? And so that's really what I've been writing about. And it's, it's funny because when I began this book, this series, it was about 10, 15 years ago that I first thought about this. And it was because I live in Southwest Virginia and I could see a lot of the tension between urban and rural living. And I thought this is going to explode fairly soon if we're not careful. So uh, the front of my uh, of flying the coop has the capital being uh, kind of destroyed by uh, um, a coup. And uh, that I wrote that long before we've had this uh, January 6th event. Um, so it's been kind of strange to see how the future has become now in a way that is quite disturbing. So that's it. Great. Thanks, Lucinda. Um, 
The fourth author on the panel this morning is Ewan Morrison. Um, Ewan is a multi-award winning novelist, screen, screenwriter, and essayist. Um, his novel, Nina X, won the um, Salt Iris Society Scottish Fiction Book of the Year Award and is currently being developed as a feature film. He's previously won the Scottish Book of the Year Fiction Prize and the uh, Glenn Fittich Scottish Writer of the Year in 2012. Uh, his first feature film and adaptation was released in five territories in 2016 and was a finalist for four international film awards. Uh, American Blackout, a feature length documentary co-written by Morrison, reached 28 million viewers. Um, Morrison has also been nominated for three Scottish BAFTAs. Um, he's gonna be talking about how to survive everything this morning. He joins us from Glasgow. Um, and um, his book that, that'll be discussing how to survive everything um, comes out uh, November 15th from Harper Perennial. Um, you and welcome, thank you. Thanks Jason and uh, thanks for having me. Um, so uh, how to survive everything. It came about really because of the COVID pandemic and I was interested in the psychology of, um, of fake news and how two sides of a family could have a different interpretation of of what was actually going on. So in COVID, we, you, you would have families where uh, half the family was mask wearers and half the, fa the family was anti-vaxxers. Uh, thankfully, I didn't have that split in my own family, but it, it did raise this this problem for me because uh, I, I have a couple of teenage kids and they were very much about socializing and getting out as much as they possibly could. So this story came to me. I thought, what if you had a protagonist and her name is Haley, and um, her father, after COVID, five years after COVID, her father, who's divorced from the mother, has become a kind of conspiracy theorist. And uh, he's, all, he's prepping for the next pandemic, the big one. He believes we're in the pandemic era. Um, and Haley only sees her dad once a week, you know, at the weekend, a little sleepover. Uh, and he does some pretty eccentric things like getting them to correct, you, you know, collect garbage and recycle it and, and, and make machines out of nothing. And she doesn't realize it, but he's become a survivalist and he's in planning for the big one. He's also got himself a place in the Highlands, uh, secreted away a safe house, hundreds of miles away from their mother. Uh, and he plans when he sees the signs to abduct Haley and her little brother and steal them away to the middle of nowhere, not even telling his divorced wife, where he's taking the kids. So the story's told from Haley's perspective as an as a reluctant abductee. And one of the things that's funny about this survivalist story is that she really doesn't want to be in the entire story. She doesn't want to be abducted. She doesn't want there to be a raging pandemic outside the safe house as her father thinks there is. Um, she wants to go back to normal life that she thinks exists beyond the security fence. Um, the problem for Haley and for many Gen Z kids is where do they get their news from? Um, because Haley's in, in a lockdown situation. There might be a pandemic happening outside. There might not be. Uh, it's, it's like, who can she trust? Can she trust her father or has he gone mad? Um, or should she trust her mother's instincts, her mother who believes, you know, that Walmart's still open and everyone's, uh, you know, being a happy consumer. So it's it's really a story of... of um, one teenager and her her attempt to put together a picture of the world uh, and it's done as a sort of pastiche of a, of a survivalist book so you have um, headlines which are like uh, chapter headlines like how to do CPR on a minor uh, how to deal with third degree burns how to amputate a leg uh, and these are all all um, chapter headings within the book Great, thanks, you and um, and again, thanks to all of you for being here, um, Lucinda and Ruthanna. We're um, enjoying the opportunity to sell your books now, and you and Silas. We look forward to um, when we're able to sell yours. So, um, the session has the title of "Alternate Futures," um, and all of your work is speculative, for sure. As you, you explore different scenarios of what may be ahead of us, um, but I think the timing of your futures is interesting. I'm curious to. You know why you chose the the future that you did. Um, we have a couple that are probably closer, and then a little two that are kind of further out. So, um, Silas and you and your futures are, are what I would think more of the nearer futures, like kind of like you know, kind of on the horizon. Um, Lucinda and Ruthanna, yours are, are I would say a bit further out. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you chose the future that you did, um, and what makes it essential to your book? Um, Silas, we can start with you on this, and then everybody, please feel free to to chime in. 
I guess I was writing about my greatest fears coming true of what I was seeing the seeds planted for while I was writing the book. And I mean, my book, you know, became more relevant just recently when Clarence Thomas wrote the opinion of, you know, uh, examining, criminalizing LGBTQ uh, relationships and things like that. So uh, I guess my philosophy was I was writing about right now um with a little with a few years on it so that it had uh you know sped it, it sped it up just a little bit um so my worst fears coming true um and also just you know I, I worry so much about um the environment and so i wanted that to be an element as well i believe that the two greatest threats to us right now are climate change and uh, christian nationalism and they both really terrify me and so I tend to write about what troubles me the deepest. I'll jump in since um, mine is are taking the same fears and worries and going in a different direction. Um, I, I, I love the quote that hope is a uh, discipline. And then I saw a great, um, quote from Kyle Schrader this morning that optimism is a design prompt and that's um, a lot of what I was going for I was trying to think of how do we get out of this what does it look like if we manage to start going in a better direction and you know among other things that that would take a while um, I've been describing this so far as a novel of big ideas but it's also a very personal novel uh, about a uh, family like mine, maybe even descended from mine, uh, living in a world where we have uh, become better at addressing big existential problems and where they're still dangerous, but where I see the biggest difference from our current world as having structures and tools in place to address them head on rather than uh, go into denial about them. So it's 2083, um, partly because I wanted to give a little time for that stuff to kick in, but partly also because I wanted to write something that was just past what I had any chance of living to see. So. I think of it as a novel about my great-grandchildren. I haven't decided which characters are my great-grandchildren, but they're in there somewhere. And as I was writing, I was thinking very hard about if you're writing a future, you are speculating that your descendants, whether literal or you know, related to people who you've influenced, you're, you're speculating that they in particular are living in that future. I also, my previous books were historical fantasy set about 60 years in the past. And so setting something about 60-ish years in the future was a really interesting mirror in thinking about how much changes and how much doesn't over that period of time. There were ways in which 1949 felt very familiar and ways in which it felt extraordinarily alien. I tried to bring that mix to the story of Judy and her family living in the Chesapeake watershed and, you know, continuing the project of handling crime, climate change and creating a more just world and also staying up late at night with crying kids and dealing with the same sort of, you know, family and child rearing problems that are at least somewhat universal. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ruthanna. Uh, I think there's some great benefits for me anyway, because I probably can't forecast too far in the future with my limited imaginary scope, but there's something useful as a writer to be able to look at sort of the consequences of where we're at just now and how that'll play out in the near future, like to create the sort of myths of the near future, if you like. So I guess there's quite a lot of writers who, who just pick up 
on a, a little thing that's happening just now and just extrapolate from it. So for me, that was the, um, the growth of survivalism and preppers. And there was a New York Times article uh, at the height of COVID that said, we are all preppers now. And as I was writing, I was thinking, yeah, you know, prepping is kind of symptomatic of part of the problem that we have in dealing with information overload um, in the modern world and fake news and, and um, all these things that, that, that really confuse us. So prepping is, is a way to say, okay, I'm going to get my 500 cans of beans and my chainsaw and probably my, my weapon and I'm going to cut myself off from the world with my family and those I love. And, and rather than solving the big things out there, like, you know, climate change or, or, um, you know, a pandemic, whatever, we're just going to lock ourselves away from the world until it's all over. So I was, I was kind of fascinated how the seeds of, of that attitude had been sown by the COVID pandemic. And I really wanted to place a family within that. We're, we're just one side of the family has gone down that route and the other side it completely hasn't and have this protagonist caught right in the middle of that manifesting that horrible i mean maybe it's 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 just this torturous thing that some writers do but we would like to place our, our our protagonist right in the middle of an existential crisis trying to work out who they, who they are and not having the answers at all um so so that limited time frame five years in the future for me is just long enough for us to see one of the outcomes of what we've just been through, and that's the rise of kind of conspiracy theory, fake news, and of the prepper slash survivalist um, attitude, which is is growing in Europe. I think still growing in America. It's where it started, um, but it, yeah, it seems to be it seems to be a big thing in the future and something to watch out for. Yeah, it, and to continue with what Ewan was saying in many ways, and what the other two writers have said. In many ways, I think that uh, I wrote this series because I do believe that the most important thing of all, the most urgent thing we've got to deal with is the future. I think we're in an age of disruption. I think that bookstores are changing, libraries are changing. Uh, I worked with for many decades with, with college students, of course, and what the future they see is very, very different from the future that we saw decades ago. Uh, the threat from climate change is huge, but the threat also from racism and homophobia and all kinds of other things that we're dealing with, uh, as Silas has pointed out, is really in enormous. So it always seems to me that one of the things that you need to impress upon students when you're teaching uh, is that imagination is the greatest antidote against despair. And it really is. It can take you out of horror and despair. Um, I wrote a book about the mass shootings at Virginia Tech because I was there at the time and I tried to get help for um, a long time for the, the shooter and for various reasons that didn't happen. But that was such a devastating thing that it made me reassess everything about who I was, who the United States was, where it was going. And I'm often asked um, why I would write about the future in the way that I have. And mainly it's because I feel as though there has to be kind of two things going on at the same time. One is, is the kind of horror of where we could take ourselves in the future if we're not careful. But then on the other hand is the fact that even those who have suffered under things like enslavement have survived have found a way to tell their stories and have found a way to do something wonderful. So in some ways, my whole series sits on the cusp, I think, between realism and magical realism. Um, and so even though it's very much grounded in a kind of literary realism, there's also that sense of that magical realism, I hope, that is um, all tied up with the flying African story. What does it mean that many of us in our kind of collective imagination, the black imagination, have, have stories that we hand down about people just spontaneously rising? Um, how can we think about that and, and get some joy from that? So I, th I think it's a, a kind of a balancing act that you often have to play between what you think could happen and the despair and the disaster. And this is a hard book in many ways, a hard series, because it doesn't shirk away from the kinds of things that women have to endure, women and girls in particular. But yet there's also that incredible seam, I hope, 
of, of joy and hope and exhilaration and, and inspiration that people have to cling to in order to be able to move on. Yeah, Lucinda, um, I, just kind of, you mentioned that the book is a hard book. I, I appreciated um, the author's note at the beginning of the book that says like this, like you, you tell it, you, you say this is a tough book. There's going to be a lot of tough things in this. Um, <laughs> if you're not ready for it, fine, but it's here for you, you know, when you are. I thought that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, we, we talked a lot about that, about whether or not that should be there. And it's always a difficult question. And I actually talked it over with my students too. Like what, what would they like? Having been through the mass shootings at Virginia Tech, there was a time in my life where it would not have been a good idea necessarily for me to have read things that were, were harsh or difficult. Um, having said that, I wrote a, a book about the tragedy. So clearly there's a part of me that, re that says, you have to be able to face that in writing, that in fact, you don't think through things unless you come at them with real honesty. So I wanted to do that, but at the same time, I also wanted to make sure that this book would, would give people hope and, uh, and would make them laugh, that there will be lots of points, I hope, where it's really funny. And, uh, and I think that that's what you do anyway as a teacher is um, you, you kind of deal in hope, which is what bookstores do too, in many ways, I think. Awesome, thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about genre, um, if that's okay. Um, it's something that that bookstores um, and booksellers struggle with a little bit at times, especially um, like my store is on the smaller side, so we don't really have room for a, you know, mystery uh, historical fiction. You know, it, it, we can't break everything down. We do actually break out science fiction, um, but I know that booksellers have a lot of different perspectives about it. Um, we see it with customers. You know, somebody will walk right past the science fiction section. And you think like, dude, there's books in there you would love if you would just, you know, stand in front of the, the section. Um, but I, and I remember once um, Rick Moody, the American novelist, was asked in an interview, he'd written a book that was kind of in between memoir and, and the novel. And um, he was asked whether the book was a memoir or a novel. And he said, that's a bookstore problem. That's not a literary problem, something like that. Um, so I'd like to have each of you, and I think like, you know, when we think about what books identify as, like two of these books definitely, like I would say identify as science fiction, um, Silas and you, and I think yours are probably more, um, you know, not necessarily aligned um, to a specific genre, but I'm just curious here as a, as a writer and an author, um, what your perspective is on genre. Um, and um, just, I guess, just kind of <laughs> what your thoughts are on that for, for the bookstore problem. And Silas, we can start with you on this. Well, first of all, just real quick, I want to acknowledge what a beautiful statement Lucinda made about imagination as an antidote to despair. I love that. I wrote it down. And um, I think that's, you know, the main thing I was thinking as I wrote this book, it wasn't so much about genre as it was just imagining something different than my reality. Um, and so for me, this book is, is firmly literary fiction, which is what I've always written. It's, it's language driven, it's character centric, it's place centric. Um, but the extra challenge and the extra joy for me was this kind of world building that has to happen in a different way when you're not writing in the quote unquote real world. Um, I've talked a lot about the issues going on in the book, but for me, the main thing is the human story. It's creating a character or characters that readers can, uh, be endeared to that readers care about. Um, and so that's, that's always what I've done in all of my books, no matter when they're set. Um, so I guess I would just say this is literary fiction for me. Yeah, I remember in the UK, we used to be told by publishers, don't say your work's literary fiction, because it'll get put in the back, and they won't have the cover out, they'll just have the spine. You know, there's this big sort of like uh, feared decline of literary fiction. So so even literary, true literary fiction authors uh, in, in my country, the publishers go, can you just tell a few lies, please, and say you're not literary fiction? <laughs> Um, so there's this sort of run towards genre. Um, I can think we're, we're with How to Survive Everything. I'm a huge Coen Brothers fan, and I love that sort of mixture of horrible darkness and, and like evil and malice and this very, very light 
humor that's very genuine, character driven, very emotional and funny, funny and goofy and local and all those wonderful things that they bring to their films. And it, it was to start with pretty hard to um, to find a category for the Coen brothers in movies. And, and now, now they're their own category. So, so maybe to be ambitious about it, maybe us secret literary fiction guys can, can create our own category of kind of crossover fiction at some point. Um, and coming from the other side, I would say my book's probably closest to a thriller, a, a family, family based thriller. Um, but, but um, you know, just like you're saying, Silas, it all comes from character for me, it always has to come from the, from the, from the core crisis of, you know, of the character and the world seen through the eyes of that character. That's, I think that's the only way I could write, I can write books. I, I love stories where the, where the characters thrown into something they don't want to be in. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way, Ewan. I really do. And I and I actually think that the old divisions between literary mainstream fiction and genre fiction are kind of dissolving. And that we now have something called literary genre. And that's essentially what all four of us seem to be doing, I think. Um, I realized that my book, my series was sci-fi fantasy, was both when I knew I had to draw maps. That really mm. kind of tells you something because you're creating such a world that that world is kind of unfamiliar to the reader. I'm an artist, so I do think visually anyway. And I'm actually I've just signed a deal for a, my next my first children's book where I'll be illustrating the book, which is really exciting to me to think about. But in in this particular book, as soon as I realized I needed to have the characters themselves drawing maps, then mm. I knew that this world was kind of both familiar and unfamiliar, magical and real, all those things together. And that doesn't mean that you jettison the literary or that you jettison character. It's still very character driven, of course it is. But I actually think that lots of literary writers jettisoned plot and decided that story wasn't important. And I think it was a terrible mistake. And I think that story has always, narrative has always got this incredible seductive quality. Uh, where if you have a really good story, you can't stop reading that story. And so again and again, I think we, we need to come back to plot and, and love plot just as much as we love character, because that is always the catalyst for character. So I think that the genre question is actually almost disappearing now and that people are claiming genre in all kinds of new and exciting ways and that we just need to be you know, pretty forthright about how we see ourselves and how we see genre being a much more fluid thing, just as sexual identity is more fluid than it's ever been. Uh, those kinds of things I think can kind of um, tell us something about where we're going as a culture and how important it is to, to go in that direction. Anna, what do you think about this? After all that, you know, agreeing with that there's definitely an overlap. And I know so many science fiction authors who, it, it's funny what you said, Erin, because a lot of people I hear saying, you know, I really want this to be a crossover book. I want to grab a piece of that sweet literary fiction audience for my science fiction book. Um, I think of myself um, pretty definitively as a speculative fiction author. You know, I always character focused, um, always is really grounded in place. I don't think I've ever written a book that seriously required a map because a, one of the seeds that I always start with is someplace that I've known and loved and can, you know, almost write in my sleep and just feel the shape of the, the geography, um, whether that's coastal Massachusetts for the Endless Legacy books or uh, the place where I live now outside of DC for a half-built garden. Um, I don't see as much of a boundary between science fiction and fantasy as around speculative fiction in general. 
Um, I'm a social scientist myself, and I find that I've put a lot of social science into even my books with magic in them. It's just that unless you are, you know, putting in some hard technology, people don't necessarily notice that you are still speculating uh, about science. <sighs> So yeah, so speculative fiction, definitely still literary elements and, you know, making use of those tools wherever I can find them. I also, I, I sometimes question the existence of mimetic fiction, especially lately when the world changes so rapidly. If you write a book that takes place in the non-specific present, as so many people do, you will end up not only speculating about the future of being wrong. I, I have read so many books lately where it's supposed to be obviously around now, but people are just going out to dinner. They're, they're going into events without masks and not getting sick or worrying about getting and there's no mention of the pandemic, and yet somehow it's 2020. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I think we're always speculating uh, about what the world is like, even if we're not aware that we're doing it. And uh, I just try to do that deliberately when I am creating my story. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just watching the clock here, but I think we have time for a couple more. Um, so <laughs> I had a question about COVID, but then it's like to talk about the past two and a half years and only talk about COVID seems like it's <laughs> like COVID's only part of the, the experience we've had or part of the upheaval. So um, so COVID, but also current events, like each of your books is a response, I think, in a lot of ways to things that are happening in real time. Um, and so I, I'd like to, for you each to comment on that. And also like, I'm just curious, like like if you tackle this issue of climate change or um, conspiracy theories or, or whatever you're going after, like, do you feel better about it after writing this book? Or is it like kind of like, like self-flagellation? Like, I mean, does it hurt to write it or do you, does it kind of make you feel better about where we might end up? And um, Ruthanna, we can start with you. Uh, sure. So I actually finished drafting this book in early March of 2020, and I sent it out to my beta readers on March 5th, and I said, please get me back comments in two weeks. And for some reason, none of them got me back comments in two weeks. Um, but it was pretty strongly shaped by writing during incipient fascism and then the editing was shaped by the pandemic uh, mostly in that uh, it's pretty hard to write full speculative fiction while everything is being terrible and there were days when I just couldn't you know hope is a discipline and you know much like any other sort of exercise they don't necessarily have that discipline successfully every day but having some focus for it was, you know, useful for me, not just as a writer, but as a person living in that world and having this ongoing thing where I had to think about, you know, it really could be different. This won't last forever. Mm -hmm. In some ways, your, your question, is you know is it flagellation or is it catharsis right which which one are we doing and it seems to me that um it is a bit cathartic to write about these kinds of issues because um you can if you're lucky you you la latch on to characters who you maybe want to be perhaps or uh they give you the hope and the and the desire and the joy that you may not necessarily have found otherwise. So characters are always, I think, the link to, to feeling that sense of, oh, I've, perhaps I've said something or she said something that would mean something to me. 
Um, and I do think that that's what we do again and again in literature, that we're always looking for those characters. And that if we're lucky, we fall in love with our characters, not to this, the extent that we're going to let them run away with everything, but we listen to them. And so literature gives you a chance to think of things from multiple points of view. You suddenly become a chorus. That's what's so exciting, I think, about writing, is that you can allow yourself to hear these other voices that are often very conflicting. I know, Silas, in your book, Southernmost, there's very conflicting views that are going on. Um, and I'm sure you've got the same kind of thing in Lark Ascending from what you've said. And it that seems to me to be at the core of what we do. In Flying the Coop, I do the same kinds of things, I think, where characters are talking about race and are trying to, to work work their way through who they are and how they're seen from the outside and how they believe they are from the inside. And, and it's always a really difficult uh, balancing act to do. Um, one of the things I did for this book was invent a game and it's played inside a birdcage by people of color. And it plays off of the whole notion of uh, why the cage bird sings and so on. And uh, and they fly on, on uh, King spins and uh, Barmer's dramas and Rosa Parks perches and all kinds of things. They fly through the coop and they play and they battle against each other. And it's become a huge thing rather like American football. And uh, and that game gives them that, that sense of uh, yearning and joy, even at the same time as they realize they will always be caged. Um, and so it's that it's that conflict that I think is often at the heart of how we write. Thanks, Silas. What do you think? Well, I think uh, what the pandemic gave to my book was uh, thinking a lot about those survival mechanisms during um, lockdown, especially. I, again and again, I returned to if I hadn't had my animals, I don't know how I would have made it. If I hadn't had music, if I hadn't had the natural world to get out in. So I really drew on those things for this book. I'm gonna put the uh, link to the playlist uh, for this novel in the chat because the music was so important. Of course, the book is named for one of the most famous musical compositions ever. And you know, I must've listened to that 14 minute composition a thousand times while I was writing this book. So I'll put that in there. But um, also just uh, thinking about the, the the way that my dog helped me through uh, caused me to write some of the chapters in the book from the point of view of the beagle in the book. And that was such a challenging and joyous ex experiment for me as a writer to put myself in the mind of the dog. There's a lot of olfactory detail in those chapters <laughs> that I was drawing on. So much of it is about a scent. Um, th those are the first things that, that come to mind. I don't want to go on too long before we run out of time. I'll turn it to you. Yeah, I think there was, in terms of, you know, catharsis or beating yourself up um, about the context that we were writing in, COVID, etc. I, I find there's, this, there's a particular passage in How to Survive Everything where the father, the conspiracy theorist, the, he's, got a, he's got an apocalyptic mindset. And his daughter, Haley, the protagonist, discovers a piece of writing he's done in his survival manual. And it's it's horrifying. His mental health is is he's suicidal. And he's writing this rather poetic passage about the day you realize the world is ending. Take yourself for a walk. Go and look at the supermarkets. Go and look at the people who don't know. Go and look at the subway trains full of people who don't care. Go and, you know, walk walk by the roads and imagine them empty. Um, and and he, he takes her on this this voyage, just a little book within the book, if you like. And for me writing that, it was so sort of heartbreaking to, to enter the situation, the mindset of someone who kind of lost the plot, if you like, and had completely bought into the apocalyptic worldview. And then even more traumatic for the daughter to read it as the spoiler alert, as the father might actually die himself from self-inflicted um, wounds. So that was hugely cathartic for me, I think. Um, but it also really flagged for me 
a great worry about fake news and our tendency to go towards apocalypse narratives, how we're drawn in and how we have been for centuries, really, and how how, how addictive an apocalypse narrative is, how the the rewards it the rewards it gives us, the hope of redemption, of 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 a big bad enemy. It's an old biblical story, really. Um, so so um, I wrote an essay, um, which is quite controversial, maybe around the book, which is called "Why I Don't Believe in Apocalypses Anymore." I did a, um, a whole bunch of research into the history of the apocalypse narrative because I find it cropping up within the book. Um, um so. It started off cathartic dealing with the apocalypse narrative, and then I just started, you know, I'm worried now about the, the role of the apocalypse narrative in our civilization and the threats, apocalyptic or otherwise, that we actually face. You know, I'm, I was drawn the other day to, to a horrific uh, potential future story. Maybe it'll be the sequel to this one. There's a virus called Lysa virus, Lysa virus, which is basically rabies. And in 2002, there was a one case of it going airborne. Now, if rabies goes airborne, we're we're screwed, basically. So uh, <laughs> I, I find myself the other day going, oh, my God, the apocalypse is back on. <laughs> um, and you just got to, like, calm down on that. We're going to deal with, you know, the climate change apocalypse carefully, methodically, sensibly. I'm not going to run away to the hills and become a survivalist. Great, thank you. Um, so we are out of time. Um, thank you so much to every for everyone uh, to everyone for joining us today. Um, to our author guests, thank you so much. Um, we look forward to selling uh, these books and all of your future books in our bookshops. Um, thank you again to our sponsors: Tor.com Publishing, Algonquin Books, Hachette, Harper Perennial, and Tor Books. Um, and again, thanks to everybody at Neba and Siba uh, for putting together a great lineup of programming this week. Um, we do look forward to being back in person soon. Um, but again, to the authors, for, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, these are all great books. They all add um, a lot to um, kind of the ongoing conversation um, that we're having right now and we appreciate it. And thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.